All right, you guys, it's Elevated here, coming at you with um, August's video. Um, this is something I've actually, like, been wanting to talk about. I knew, like, from the moment I started my channel, I would actually um, eventually have to touch on this topic. And we're finally here talking about it. Um, it's something I've decided to call Delirium Amor, or Amore, however you want to pronounce that. Um... On the Madness of Love, Possession, and Attachment. Um, so yeah, that's our big topic for today. We're going to be touching on a lot of different stuff. Um, Kierkegaard and C.S. Lewis are two of the main sources that I'm using for this video. But yeah, um, we'll go ahead and get into it. And um, of course, while we're talking about love... Um, can't really talk about it without talking about like the big elephant in the room aka sex right so we're gonna touch on that uh, topic first actually and um we're gonna look at it from the fringes of um these two like out well i don't even know if they're outlier groups anymore um but you have like the sex positive feminist leftist liberal of course um versus um i can't even to say the name of these people without getting flagged by YouTube, um, the color of this pill down here, you know, um, this, this phrase right here, um, basically these people who, um, typically men, um, who view, um, marriage and society in general as, like, pandering to women, this and that, they also have, like, other crazy ideas if you go into them, um, like how 80% of all women are gold diggers, cheating sluts and whores and selfish and all this uh, <laughs> extra stuff. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, they also view um, society as like very, very like um, basic, like um, um, alpha males, beta males. These are the same type of people who believe in all that, all that shit as well. Um, so whenever they hear something like sex positivity, sexual freedom, stuff like that, sexual liberation, what people think it means, it's like very open. You'll have people who are more um, open with their choices for sexuality. You still have like representation for people who are monogamous in their own way as well. Um, Whereas, like, from their perspective, what they think it actually means is, like, you have the alpha male who sleeps with the majority of the women, the beta male who, um, sticks around as a friend and, like, tries to, like, um, get sex from that and only ends up sleeping with, like, one or two women, maybe, and then all the other, um, involuntary celibates <laughs> they would call themselves uh so these are the type of people that view society as like this whole big like um <clears throat> um like oppressive machine against like uh, against men they'll say stuff like um oh if men are so privileged then why are we the ones fighting all the wars and doing all the hard jobs and stuff like that <laughs> very funny um then you have, like, one step further where, like, you even have the people who are like, oh, this entire movement is actually, they're trying to do this to us. Um, they're making men, like, more, like, um, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> um, so basically this side uh, pretty much agrees with this um, basic tenet of feminine Ugh. Feminism encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, abortion, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. <laughs> These are also the people who, like, ironically will believe um, stuff like this. Like, we mentioned this in the, uh, seeing the forest for the trees video, I think. But yeah. Um, so, like, the people who are like, wow, you suck at math whenever they see a guy doing bad math, but then they'll see a woman doing bad math and be like, wow, girls suck at math. Um, stuff like that. Um, so, uh, now I'm talking about, like, these, these, these movements on, like, broad terms. Like, obviously, like, individual people might be, like, um, like, a sex-positive feminist can still be, like, a right-wing, um, like, fiscally conservative, 
like the people are going to like mix and match and be in between all these different like stuff but generally if you can see um this is something i wanted to point out about like the systematic thinking um if you can see how these people um relate to these people you'll also see similarities and stuff like um like obviously like a, a, a republican and um democrat um i think it's really funny when people are like well le leftists are different than liberals and i'm just like i don't even see republicans and democrats or conservatives and liberals like they're all the same to me <laughs> honestly so when you want to like get the nitpicky of this and that it's like ah, it doesn't even matter but more broadly speaking um this is also another dichotomy that you kind of see through society these people tend to be more apple product users these people tend to be more android um Another one, uh, these people tend to <laughs> be more into Marvel. These people tend to be in the more edgy, like, DC movies, stuff like that. Um, there was a, a post that said something like, um, what did it say? Wednesday, 8 p.m. and October all have the same vibe. And if you can, like... If you can grasp that, if you can grasp why not only are these, like, dichotomies, like, ubiquitous, that's the kind of, like, systematic thinking you have to really, like, understand to be able to look at all this stuff um, on an objective level, I guess. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that real quick. Um, but between these two groups, um, C.S. Lewis actually mentions um, this phrase in one of his writings. Um, it's called balancing the gravity and the levity of Venus. Um, so these, this group can generally be summed up as um, people who view um, Venus, the goddess of love, and sex in general as like having so much gravitas, so much gravity, take it very seriously, <laughs> stuff like that. And then these people tend to view Venus um, with more levity. It's more about like having freedom and expression and being um, prideful and happy and stuff like that. And um, we're actually going to talk about um, more in detail about this uh, in a minute, but I, I did want to point out uh, some stuff about this. So There was there was a post that I saw of um, a woman in her like early twenties I want to say maybe mid twenties um, who um, became a stripper and her way of like coming out to her parents she made a whole um, like PowerPoint presentation and sat them down and like talked about all the various like common misconceptions and stuff like that and um, it was really funny because you saw in the comments. Um, Obviously, all the top comments were, wow, your parents are so supportive. Like, I'm pretty sure the dad, like, clapped at the end or something like that. And, like, so, like, all the top comments were, like, wow, your parents are so supportive. That's really cool. And then the next comments, of course, would be, like, oh, wow, they're not they're not very good parents because they're letting her ruin her life and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so you do generally kind of see that um, a lot. Um, I do want to bring this up as well. Um so like in the sex industry, opinions on the sex industry are diverse. So feminists are generally either critical of it, seeing it as exploitative, a result of patriarchal so social structures and reinforcing sexual and cultural attitudes. So I do want to uh, remember this word right there, because we're going to be bringing that up later too, um, that are complicit in rape and sexual harassment or supportive of at least parts of it. Okay, yeah. So yeah, yeah um, they're generally either critical of it um, of the sex industry of stuff like that because it, it does like reinforce and like um all, like toxic behaviors I would say, um. Or they're supportive of, of at least parts of it, arguing that some forms can of it can be a medium of feminist expression, and a means of women uh, taking control of their sexuality. Um. Now, as far as like uh, a medium of feminist expression. And like an expression of sexuality, um, 
I really don't have like any like negative opinions on that. Like if it's done for like creative purposes, um, I know like well obviously like stripping is like very erotic, but like really all forms of dance like at least like touch. Even if they're not like explicitly sexual, they do like touch on like some like erotic, um, somewhat erotic in some nature. Like any any form of like um, dance that's gonna be like an expression of the body is. Um, going to somewhat express sexuality in some way as well I guess um but even if it it doesn't like it it doesn't matter like it's still like uh okay the last video we talked about action and intention being important like if your intention is like this like creative expression like that's not as bad as saying um doing it for money I would say um so like yeah you would have the um people in the comments who would talk about like oh uh, you just don't want to see you just don't like to see a woman like prosper and flourish and like express her sexuality chase happiness and stuff like that and it's like um <clears throat> um it's like it's 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 dicey when you start talking about that stuff like um like pornography um like uh, especially with like the uh, the only fan stuff that's uh, that's come out um it's like um like a part of me wants to say yeah go chase that paper like you're you're just doing you're just taking advantage of like yeah you're just getting money for it another part of me is like um like um for example like i used to give um plasma like i've 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 lived paycheck to paycheck before. I've been, like, very, very much, like, in in poverty to where, like, I pretty much had to give plasma to, like, feed myself at at some points in my life. Um, But, like, at this point in my life, I wouldn't do that anymore. Like, I would would much rather starve than actually, like, there's just something, like, inherently wrong. Like, on such a, like, deep primal level of, like, actually giving my physical blood for money like even if it's for something as like simple as like just buying food to survive like it still seems wrong to me on some level um so that part of me is like also uh, a little bit critical of like the only fan shit but um it is what it is well we're, i'm actually going to talk about that later about like opinions and like <laughs> how you don't need to express them or you don't need to like <laughs> talk to other people and like say like I don't think what you're doing is right like I don't I don't care honestly (laughs) it is what it is um however one other thing I do want to talk about um mention so women taking control of their sexuality my only question about this in particular is like are you taking control of your sexuality or are you allowing your sexuality to take control of you um and I don't know. It it could be either or. Um, you really have to be honest with yourself and um, be able to be very critical and objective to be able to answer that um, truthfully. But that's that's your concern, not mine. I don't really care. I'd rather just take you at your word and uh, move on, right? Um, another thing about like the expression of sexuality, another thing that they would talk about is like um, not being ashamed to express your sexuality, um, and you, you have this, um, general, like, um, implication that, like, um, oh, in order to, like, uh, not be ashamed, you have to be prideful, when it's, like, the opposite of shame isn't, like, pride, it's actually no shame, but, um, we've been conditioned for whatever reason to believe oh you have no shame like that sounds a lot worse than taking pride in what you're doing even though pride is (laughs) one of the deadly sins and (laughs) whatever uh it is what it is um yeah that's pretty much all i have to say on that like that side that side of the debate um, this side, um, I actually have a little bit more to say just cause like I've been on the fringes of it. It's actually like, if you, if you look at like, um, just on the surface level, it looks like I'm doing the same things 
that these people are doing. Like, I don't go into relationships. I don't try to fall in love. I'm not trying to have kids. Um, but it's like their reasoning for it is like completely antithetical to mine. <laughs> it's really funny, but we'll get into it. Um, so you have these like um, different levels. So the blue pill, obviously, right down here, they call it <laughs> white knights is their phrase for any, basically any person who stands up for a woman in any situation. <laughs> Um, but yeah, most likely to be in a long-term relationship or married, uh, then divorced later on in life, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, then they get to this level, um, and they mention, um, question, they question marriage and the role of men, so they'll see stuff that's, like, actually true, like, um, how in divorce courts, um, men are usually discriminated against as being primary caretakers, um, cause they assume stuff like a women have like the more natural instinct to be a better caretaker than men. Um, so they'll see stuff like that. Um, it's funny because they say this is the lowest but powerful step to the red. Uh, well, I almost said it, but yeah, it's the lowest but powerful step. Um, I would say it's powerful because this is probably the last stop where, um, uh, they start telling you like truth and then start building a narrative and fiction around it. Um, so all these steps really try to, like, um, play up the narrative. Um, so evaluation step right here. They, um, they either got burned or observed men get burned by the gynocentric society. Oh, that's one thing I wanted to point out, too, between the two. So, um, this, this side, um, actually I can just go back. This side right here believes in a that we live in a patriarchal society that men are given more privileges and women are oppressed this side right here believes that we live in a gynocentric society where women are given all the privileges and men are oppressed and they have different reasons for believing both of that stuff um and they actually have like good points like yeah women are um generally given less agency in society and men are generally given like harsher um not given but like they 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 usually have to go through like harsher like jobs or like they're, they're usually the soldiers and stuff like that um but we'll talk about that in a minute but yeah the gynocentric society they reject relationships with date women with extreme cautions um <laughs> Chivalry and dating is dead at this point. Men engage a simple life, blah, 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 blah. Then you move up to this level. Um, women, with the exception of family and close, clo closest friends, will have to fend for themselves. And they now have established a wall of silence, blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> it's really funny because it's like... Um, the, the people who get, get into these levels, they tend to start talking about women basically as as a force like we talked about in that video like they view women as like um um this homogenous group so like they'll say stuff like um women don't want to get with a guy like me women uh, are like this why don't women do this and that like they're only ever talking about women as the group and never like on an individual level um because they'll see see if we can go back to it blah 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 blah. they'll see like a majority of people or sorry a majority of women are gold gold digging cheating slutting sluts and whores blah 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 and they're always like um see the forest for the trees um even even if <laughs> I, like i i'm i'm very skeptical of um that uh statistic like obviously it's not that bad <laughs> i would say it's probably the reverse uh, if anything um i don't really care either way though because it's like um when you when you talk about women in relationships and you're only ever talking about women in general like why are you always trying to like get with like, you're not trying to, wait, like, it doesn't make any sense, like, you're, you're trying to become, like, the most attractive person to the most amount of women, when it's, like, a relationship is about being attracted to the single person, or whatever, uh, I don't know, um, oh yeah, one thing I do want to mention is, like, we do live in a 
population of like almost a billion at this point. So if you want to sit there and believe that all women do this, you will find enough evidence for it because there's enough people out there like even if like out of 8 billion people, like even the most fringe, like the most ridiculous out there like um a hobby or interest or whatever you will find a group of like hundreds of people who are also into it and that's the thing about like the internet too is really like if you want to sit here and talk about like oh all women are this or all women are that like you'll find enough people to give you the evidence for it because there's just that many people out there um the thing is you will also um have um you are also just as capable to find as much evidence against it as well. Um, so it's like, um, it, it, it really, it really comes down to like your choice of how you want to view reality, um, at that point. Like if it, it's, it's your choice to view a reality as being like really fucked up. And then the whole thing about like the patriarchy or the gynocentric society, um, like, I, I don't know why these people don't realize this, but it's like the world is fucked up, but it's not an agenda against one group. And it's, <laughs> if you'll notice, it's always like, oh, it's always against my group. It's like, no, it's not feminism versus men. It's not patriarchy against women. It's not gynocentric city against men. Every single class and classification of person is uh, discriminated against in some way in society. It's like um, every si- uh, as well as every single class also has like their own set of um, privileges as well. Um, so it's like, um, to me, it's like good seeing the different, like, um, racial abilities in like Skyrim or one of those like, um, RPG games, like every race is going to have, um, um, perks. Every race is going to have, every person is going to have perks. Every person is going to have, um, what are those called? Like negatives, um, I don't even know what that's called, debuffs or whatever. It's been a while since I played those games. But anyways, um, people always want to view um, oppression in society as like very like one dimensional, or I don't even know if this is one dimensional, two dimensional, but just like very, very simplistic. So they'll see, um, oh, women are oppressed; they're weighed down by their oppression, and men. Um, are free, they're free from oppression, they, that way they're not as weighed down as much, they're able to flourish, and so you kind of have this, like, implicit, it's, like, not explicitly stated, it's an implicit assumption that, like, oh, you're supposed to give over some of this oppression to men, like, you're supposed to oppress men down to your level, um, in order to balance out and make everyone equal, which is uh, really fucked up because like all you have to do is like take the oppression off these people but like that's this is like actually the hidden assumption oh and um if we go back i'm gonna mention this too right here because society is really like and this is still only like um two dimensions technically three dimensions because it's um it's movement in an XY plane over time. Um, and so this is really um, a simplistic version of it. But, like, you have... This is really how oppression works. So, like, you get a point in society where, let's say, like, men are, like, completely in charge. And then you have all this, like, um, resentment and, like, downward force gravity almost um, pushing towards um, the uh, equilibrium. And that's actually what causes the motion to swing to the other side. So it's like, um, when they say the future is female, it's like, yeah, it was male. And they're pushing so much against it. And you'll notice, sorry if I can get it down there, the um, force is going this way. Um, 
and they uh, it's like people always think of oh like um our society is up here therefore we have to push it this way to get it balanced and it's like no it's a pendulum and the only way to balance it or the only way to find equilibrium is without any motion towards either side this is <laughs> basically what walking the middle path means <laughs> i would say um <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it's it's like if you really want to stop oppression, you can't keep like exciting the pendulum. So like all this reactionary stuff of of um, well, I talked about my conflict video. Anytime you put place a conflict between two things, like you're you're creating instability you're actually creating um the forces necessary to keep this pendulum swinging um and again this is like a very simplistic um thing um so when you talk about like all of society you've got a multi multi-dimensional pendulum swinging in multiple um arrays and stuff like that um but yeah, uh, that's all I have to say about that stuff. Um, I did want to, um, I did have a, a, an aside about some of this stuff as well. Um, I call it the perversion of ideals. Um, so you have the pursuit of happiness. And on this side, I'm probably going to be bringing up. Um, it's kind of what I brought up about, like the, the, the stripper who came out to her parents. Um, so there's these like basic assumptions that are made, um, which are pretty much false. Um, or, or at least incomplete, I would say. Um, so you have like, I have a right to be happy. Um, any action is excusable if it was done for my own happiness. Um, you would see this generally with like, um, cheaters as well. Like, oh yeah, I know I'm in this like stable relationship, but if someone comes along and sweeps me off my feet, like I have an obligation, like, or, or uh, actually, I, I think I mentioned that in a later point, but like, it's basically like, um, if if he sweeps me off my feet and I go off, like, I'm doing it for my own happiness, therefore, like, it's excusable, right? Like, I did it, like, it, <laughs> even if it's, it's selfish, like, it is what it is, like, it, I'm chasing my own happiness, and that's, I have the freedom to do that. Um, I have the freedom to choose how I chase happiness despite risks, and so you have, like, um, the people who were defending the stripper in the comments, um, we're talking about like, um, oh, well, she was doing it in a, in a controlled way, this and that. She said nobody in the club did drugs, which is kind of funny. I'm like, that's, that's highly unbelievable, but okay, whatever. Um, there's still like, um, risks involved i would say with um doing that like there's if if you want to express your sexuality and doing and do it do that through like dance like there's much better options to do that than like working at a strip club now granted they're probably not going to be as um um well paying of course but like it is still like you're still you if if you really are just doing it for the for the creative aspect like you're gonna get the same amount of like fulfillment from it i would say spiritual fulfillment not material fulfillment um but yeah that's one of the assumptions that they uh like the implicit assumptions that they make is like despite the risks i'm doing what makes me happy so i'm doing what's right like I said, yeah, I have an obligation to chase what will make me happier. So yeah, like I said, if someone's in a relationship and someone comes by and they sweep them off their feet, like they have an obligation to go after that person, even though, um, like in spite of the relationship. Um, but yeah, um, another one, I deserve to be respected for my choices. So like, even if I'm making, um, big risks, well, they'll call it big risks, they're not stupid risks. Uh, <laughs> it, that's just a matter of perspective, really. Um, but, like, um, there's the assumption that, like, 
I I have the the right to be happy. I have the right to pursue happiness. Therefore, I deserve to be respected for my choices and how I choose that. And it's like this one's very insidious because it's like you don't deserve anyone's respect, really. Um <clears throat> like you'll have um cuz everyone's going to have a different opinion on what happiness is, how to chase it and stuff like that. You don't deserve to be respected for your choices. You'll always have someone like my the classic trope that, that comes to mind is like the city slicker who comes by and sees like oh the the farmer um getting his hands dirty and making a very menial wage and he'll like scoff at him and then the farmer will look at him and and be like well at least I'm doing an honest job and feel safe in his own way like these two people are gonna like (laughs) um they're never gonna like respect each other for their choices but like they respect themselves for their choices and that's really what's more important like you you don't deserve the respect of other people and you shouldn't be seeking the respect of other people like as long as you're doing what if if I would say if you're worried about the respect of other people, that would mean on some level you don't entirely respect what you're doing. Um, whereas if you do like fully respect what you're doing and you see no qualms with it, you're not going to worry about the respect of others. That's just my two cents. Um, another um, perversion of ideals. Oh, this one's good. Um, cause this will be more about the right wing people, um, freedom of speech slash opinion. Um, so basic assumptions, false assumptions that are made. I have the freedom to express slash hold any opinion, uh, no responsibility to the quality of opinion. Um, and that's one thing about these things is like, um, people say like, oh, I have the freedom. I have the freedom. And they, they, they just think the freedom is all there is when it's like, um, who's that uncle ben's quote with great power comes great responsibility honestly it should have been with great freedom comes great responsibility um because um people want to say like oh i don't care i i can hold any opinion i have the freedom of speech i can say whatever i want and it's like no you live in a democracy and you actually have an obligation a responsibility and a duty to make sure that opinion is well informed and of high quality, um, and you, you owe that duty to like yourself, your and your neighbors and your country, in order for democracy to work properly. Like you don't just have, you don't just have like it's not just oh I'm free to speak whatever I want. I'm free to hold any opinion that I want. It's like no, there's there's a there's a flip side to that. Like there is an obligation and duty attached to that. Um, another one, like they, like the one down there, I deserve to have my opinions respected, no responsibility. Um, and these last two are actually pretty, pretty insidious as well. These come from like social media and the whole like, oh, I got it. I got to do this. I got to, I got to speak my mind. I owe it to myself. Like I'm obligated to speak my mind. I have the freedom to express all my opinions. Um, is one of the assumptions, and uh, another implication from that is I must have opinions for every topic. (laughs) Like, it's okay to not have an opinion on a topic. Um, And I must actively exercise this freedom and express myself at all times. Um, So one one thing I would mention right here is, like, um, anti-natalist. Like, I'm, I'm, I would not consider myself an anti-natalist. Like I I choose not to have kids, but that's not that doesn't mean that I hold the opinion that no one should have kids, or I feel like people who have kids are dumb. It's like it's just not something I want to do. It's my own personal choice, and I hold no opinion on what somebody else does because I I don't need to. Like you you don't have to hold opinions on what other people do. <laughs> like people forget that that's an actual option sometimes, you know. Um. But yeah, these last two, um, it's like you're constantly, if you're, and it's always funny because these people, uh, um, 
on the right, uh, the Christian patriot truthers are always like, um, oh, I, they're, they're trying to censor us, and, um, they're trying to control us, and this and that, and, um, blah, 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 but they're doing it, like, on Facebook, and on YouTube, and on this and that, um, when they don't realize, like, um, every time you comment, every time you like, every time you subscribe, every time you engage with any form of, like, um, social media, like, that's, you're feeding that algorithm, you realize that? Like, you, 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 (laughs) like, you don't have to, like, like, just because you like a picture on Instagram doesn't mean you have to go and sit there and press the like button, just because you see someone saying something that, in your opinion, is stupid or backwards, you don't have to sit there and comment your opinion all the time. And that's one of the, um, that's one of the, uh, perversions of the freedom of speech is like, oh, I have the freedom to speak, therefore I should speak at all times, (laughs) anytime, all the time, no filter, brutal honesty. Oh, there was a post that I saw about, um, like people who are into brutal honesty are, um, more concerned about the brutality than the honesty. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Um, but yeah. Um, another thing about the the Patriot Truthers, about this freedom of speech, like they're talking about like, oh, it's just going to get worse and worse. Like, it's just two weeks. It's just a mask. Like, but... <laughs> <coughs> um, so the people who think um, this stuff is going to get... Um, excuse me, become mandatory. My thing is like, the only reason it would is because people were so adamant and so arrogant uh, at this stage. Like everyone had to, had to like, no, no one on the right, on the whole like truth or side treated it with any, any amount of maturity. Like it was always just, Oh, I'm I'm a free American. I can do what I want. And (laughs) you are oppressing me. And blah, 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 blah. Like it (sighs) acted like fucking children. (laughs) Like the whole time. And it's like, you realize like your behavior during all of this last year and this year. Like you are the reason this shit is happening. And like, they're like, oh, I'm not a sheep. I don't fall for the stupid stuff, I don't fall in line, it's like, you fell right in line with what they wanted you to do, do you realize that? I'm not going to say any more about this, we're moving on, um, (laughs) but yeah, um, so I think this next topic is, yeah, possession, and this is a very stupid, like, uh, hypothetical, but it is what it is, Um, it's not, it's not perfect, I understand that, it's not accurate, I understand that, but it, it, it does kind of, like, point out what I'm trying to say. Um, so the first person, um, picks up a thing, we'll say it's, like, a stick or something, they say, I'm gonna pick up this thing and make it mine, something that's never happened before. Um, um, so, like, they, it, it's picking this thing up, like, the stick and doing this does two, it, it implies two things when you say, I'm going to make it mine and be the first person to make this thing mine. It implies that this one thing is now the only thing you own. Like, as soon as you pick that thing up, all of a sudden, you don't own anything except that thing. Um, this also implies that everything else can be owned. If I can pick up this thing, this stick, and why can't I pick up that stick? Or I can pick up this, or this or that, and stuff like that. Um, you have the first person obviously going to come up, and because this is the human nature, this is how people are. They're going to be like, hey, that's not fair. I, I want that thing. Why, why, why do you get to keep it? Blah, 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 blah. She's, and then she says, well, it's my thing. I made it. It's my, it's, I'm, I possess it. I own it. And this person, of course, gets the idea, well, if you can take it as yours, I can take it as mine. Human nature, like, you're probably either going to steal that or uh, probably the more likely case. Um, I can take other things, too. And, of course, human nature always wants to... I think it's like... 
a person doesn't feel secure unless they're more prosperous than most other people. Like, it's it, that's a very f- fucked up, like, part of human nature that's like, oh, I don't feel happy unless I'm doing better off than my neighbor. <laughs> like, it's so, so wrong, but like, it is what people, people do. Um, so I wrote down, the first act of laying claim on one single thing necessitates that everything else is to be taken, that everyone else can take their own claims, not just you. And that even though you're rich for being the first and only person to own the first thing, you are necessarily poor for only having the one thing. Um, so, like, you see this person have more things than you, and all of a sudden, like, you picked up this thing, and you said, I'm going to make it mine, and this is all you needed at the moment, but you see this... It's like keeping up with the Joneses. You see this um, other person with more things and all of a sudden your human nature kicks in. And you're like, well, I got to get more things too. (laughs) Excuse me. Basically, all I'm trying to say here is that the act of possession, the act of ownership of stuff like this, it's it's a type of madness. It's a type of like insidious madness. Um, It's an effective madness because it's infectious. It, it it goes as soon as the first person um, decides to possess something, all of a sudden, like, this shit spreads like wildfire. <sighs> um, and then we can kind of relate it to um, relationships. Like, um, there's definitely that whole dynamic of, like, people who see a person with someone and they're like, oh, I, can, I want that person too. If you can have them, why can't I? And then they'll go out and also get more people. Like, oh, my person's more attractive than your person. Doesn't that make you jealous? Stuff like that. So yeah, love and possession. Um, so you you do have like abusive relationships, obviously. Um, unbalanced power dynamics. Like one person is like in, in charge of the other. They wear the pants in the relationship, quote unquote. I own you. Um, so this is, like, a very, like, explicit form of possession. Um, and then we're also going to be talking about, like, polyamory versus monogamy. Um, so you do have, like, um, like, I'm not, it's, it's entirely possible for a polyamorous relationship to establish healthy boundaries, um, such as, like, in, like, open relationships or however form or whatever. Um, I'm not too worried about, like, that, um, type right now. Um, I do want to point out, um, the more, like, um, it's almost like the the more, like, traumatized people who fall into this category, um, people who say, like, no one owns me, um, they, they don't compromise, there's no compromise, there's no commitment for any relationship, there's even, like, most of the time, there's no relationships in general, um, these people are very, like, so against possession and ownership they're they, like they're more concerned about not being owned rather than like not owning someone else if that makes sense so like um any act of commitment is seen as a betrayal towards oneself um kind of falls in line with that um and it's really funny because um these people tend to see m- most if not all monogamists as, like, being in abusive relationships, which, like, if you think about it, does make sense, because, um, obviously, it's going to be, um, very rare, or, like, virtually impossible to have, like, a perfectly balanced, sorry, perfectly balanced power dynamic between two people, so, like, their argument is that no matter what, all relationships eventually end up being abusive at some point, um, and um it's like anytime they talk about a monogamy they they always attack it as being like abusive as being possessive um in a way <clears throat> um whereas like um, monogamy is it's like mostly um considered it's kind of like we are a unit um so one does not possess the other. The union itself or the marriage itself possesses both. 
So it's like not one person is not committed to another and vice versa. It's like both people are committed to the relationship itself. Um, so that's like it's like it's almost like they're possessed by the possession, by the union, more so than they possess the other person. Um, but again, like I said, all of this goes back to like human. It's all possession in the end, and human nature is human nature. So like even monogamy, like I would consider myself, uh, even though I don't date anymore, I would consider myself a monogamist. I, I still see a lot of issues with that as well. Um, but yeah, actually we're going to be talking about them um, in this in this slide. Um, so like the commitment for life. This is one thing that I've always like kind of questioned. Um, but now I'm starting to see like, oh, I was right. Like I should have like listened to that question, like that nagging question in the back of my head. Um, so this like idea that a monogamous uh, relationship, a perfect re marriage or whatever is like a commitment for life. Um, my question to that was always, um, if you are constantly changing, developing, evolving through life, how can you commit to another person who is also changing, developing and evolving in their own ways? How can you assure yourself that you will be the same person that loves that person? let alone assure yourself that they will also remain the same. Um, one thing that I've noticed, a lot of people like tend to stop um, maturing, either like after high school or after college. Um, they tend to stunt their um, development, um, fall into habits of behavior and stuff like that. And my thing is like... Either way, like, whether you're a person who's, like, let's say, like, you're constantly maturing and the person you're dating, like, um, it's a stopping point of their maturity. Like, how, 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 how would you, how would you, why would you, uh, <laughs> still, like, commit to that relationship? Um, or even vice versa, if you're a person who doesn't mature and you're holding back a person who is maturing beyond you, like, why would you, why would you ask them to hold themselves back for you? Like, it's a very, like, um, it's invasive almost asking for a life commitment from someone else, I would say. Um, and then the even more egregious, um, issue I have with, like, monogamy and true love and soulmates and stuff like that is a commitment beyond life. Like, how audacious is it to suggest a compact with another being to remain together throughout all of eternity? It's audacious. It's very... It, 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 the idea insults me, honestly. Like, let alone, like, life, you're constantly developing and maturing and evolving. But, like, as a as a... If you believe in this sort of stuff as, like, a spiritual being, you expect to, like, commit to another being for all of eternity. That <laughs> oh, just sounds awfully ridiculous to me. Awfully atrocious. It is what it is. Um, but, yeah, now we're finally moving on to C.S. Lewis's Four Types of Love. Um, and we're kind of going to touch on them. The only two ones I'm really going to focus on are, like, affection and, like, romance. Um, but I will go over all of them right here real quick. So, storgy or affection is typically, um, like, you'll see it with, like, pets or um, with children. Um, actually, like, children who aren't here. You're just like, oh, that's such a cute baby. Stuff like that. Or, like, that's such a pretty puppy. Stuff like that. That's typically affection. Um, philia, friendship. Um, pretty self-explanatory, although I thought it was very interesting, um, C.S. Lewis mentioned how, um, I think I wrote it down. Oh, yeah, back in his time, they were, like, sexually repressed, um, so even in his time, um, any form of, like, um, fully expressed friendly love, uh, between two males was seen as, like, homosexual, which I find very interesting, because that's st that stigma is, like, still true even nowadays. Like, um, I still find it very hard to tell uh, my friends, even my brother sometimes, that I love them. It's very, like, it's a very, like, 
it's 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 a very like deep rooted stigma. I don't know where that comes from, but that's really not the point of this um point of this video, so we're not really going to mention it beyond that. Um and then romance as well, um which obviously has a sexual aspect. Uh, I kind of already went over that. Um but we're also not going to be talking about it cuz um CS Lewis said it is marriage itself, not the marriage bed, which will be likely to prevent us from waging uninterruptedly on God. So we're going to go a little bit more into that. Like his problem with romance wasn't the sex, it was the romance. Um, and then you have, uh, of course, the um, uh, agape or agape, uh, charity or godly love, which we're actually going to leave a mystery <laughs> for this video. Because uh, you can go and read it yourself. It's not that long. Um, it, it, I will say it is, it, is, it is different. A lot of people confuse like storgy or affection with uh, charity or godly love. Like they, they think um, this type of love is, oh, you just have to love everyone equally and, and show them um, sympathy and this and that. It's like, no, this is entirely different. Like if you think if you think this type of love is that, then you probably need to do more research on it. But yeah, we'll start with storgy or affection. Um, and this is good because this is where we're actually going to start talking about like the insidious Disney greed as well. Um, but yeah. The conflict between good and evil is represented simply as a conflict between the domestic affections and, say, ambition or snobbery or gambling or whatnot. Um, I think in his time, uh, like, a good version of this would be, like, um, Mr. Scrooge from, like, what was that, A Christmas Carol, I want to say? Um, the, the conflict between good and evil is, like, uh, he just needed to find the spirit of Christmas and be more charitable instead of being snobbish and greedy. Um, yeah. Um, and when the hero is claimed or reclaimed by the domestic affection, we're apparently meant to feel that he is saved. Of course, no Christian could accept this idolatry of the domestic affections. Those authors write as if they've never heard, never even felt the need of denying the text about hating wife and mother in one's own life or so for Christ's sake. Um, we talked about that in the um, being in the world, not of the world video. I um, thought that was really funny. He mentioned that too. Um, he says, we've been better taught. We know that every natural impulse, however innocent in itself, may stand between God and us and so become an idol. So yeah, in his time, it was more so like the domestic affection or storgy. Um, I do want to mention, uh, let's start talking about like the insidious Disney greed because um, I grew up um, during the Disney Renaissance in the 90s, watching all those movies as a kid. Um, so in his time, it was like the domestic affections and obviously in our time, I would say um, it was more so like love that was given that idolatry. Um, that idolatrous um, position. Um, and I actually mentioned this uh, very first video on astrology. So this is from Levette. I'm um, talking about olive oil and Popeye versus Brutus. Um, so you have, she's constantly caught between the two men. And it's like, they're both like, um, fundamentally the same person. They're both brutish. Obviously one of them's name is Brutus. And they're both like, overly masculine there's they solve their problems with violence this and that really the only difference is between the two is pot by intensity uh, uh, treats olive oil with a little bit more respect but <laughs> overall they're both very like primitive masculine um barbaric people like low low vibrational low chakra people um uh, so she's constantly caught between um like oh what being rescued by one, saved by one, and um, rescued from the other. Uh, whenever, like, the real, what you should really be getting out of that is uh, the idea of, like, rescuing oneself instead of relying on others. So, like he said, um, like C.S. Lewis said um, just then, 
Whereas like the domestic affection um, isn't going to save you in the same way that the insidious Disney greed says love will not save you. So like the idea in the 90s was like, oh, you'll just find true love and that'll save you from um, all the all the struggles and pain and heartache and you'll live happily ever after. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's why I call it insidious Disney greed because they seem to like want to be... Like, they want to be the pedestal that puts up all of these um, idols. Um, so in the 90s, you had that. But, like, you'll, you'll, it's, it's different nowadays. So they're, like, moving away from, like, love itself. Nowadays, um, I would say it's more about... Um, well, I, I tend to watch, um, watch it more from, like, the superhero perspective. Um, but you also have, like, movies like John Wick and, like, The Equalizer and stuff like that. Um seems like the general um like idol they're putting up there is like fighting against um the end of the world almost like fighting against any group of people that wants to destroy the world which is so insidious it's like because it's so easy to be like um to tell a conservative oh the liberals want to end the world with their progressive ideals of like open sexuality and um it's so easy to tell a liberal, oh, the Christians want to end the world with their um, oppression and their, um, um, like, just their overt power and stuff like that. Like, it's it's so easy to prop up, like, your enemy as being, um, like, the destroyer of the world. Um, but, like, all these all these movies nowadays are all talking about, like, well, I mean, you, I mentioned it earlier from Spider-Man, with great, great power comes great responsibility, and it's like, oh, if, if you don't do anything, whenever, like, these people are getting ready to destroy the world, it's your fault, it's like, no, it's the fault of the people actually doing the destroying, first of all, just because I don't stand up and do anything, like, this is, we talked about this in, um, being in the world and not, not of the world, we talked about this in um, um, the conflict video. Like it's <laughs> it, <laughs> once you see like how they're like propping these things up, like it's very easy to like see. All right, so that's what you're telling me to do. Guess I better do not do that. You know. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <sighs> And finally, finally, we get to start talking about eros or romance. Um, this is where we actually start talking about the delirium amore. Um, I, and I actually like that he talks about eros as if it were an actual god um, with motivations and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we'll get into it. Um, for it is the very mark of eros that when he is in us, we had rather share unhappiness with the beloved than be happy on any other terms. Even if the two lovers are mature and experienced people who know that broken hearts heal in the end and can clearly foresee that, if they once steeled themselves to go through the present agony of parting, they would almost certainly be happier ten years hence than marriage is at all likely to make them. Even then, they would not part. To Eros, all these calculations are irrelevant. Just as the coolly brutal judgment of Lucretius is irrelevant to Venus, even when it becomes clear beyond all evasion that marriage with the beloved cannot possibly lead to happiness, when it cannot even profess to offer any other life than that of tending an incurable invalid, of hopeless poverty, of exile, or of disgrace, Eros never hesitates to say, better this than parting. Better to be miserable with her than happy without her. Let our hearts break, provided they break together. If the voice within us does not say this, it is not the voice of Eros. Um. Yeah. Uh, this is... Uh, this is one of the reasons why I, I have like called off love from my life, um, um, 
like through through this like mindset i've suffered i've i've suffered through and put other people through suffering that we really didn't need to go through um yeah he goes in again um and there's more to it too um so those who have idolized eros they thought he had the power and truthfulness of a god they expected that mere feeling would do for them and permanently all that was necessary when this expectation is disappointed they throw the blame on eros or more usually on their partners in reality, however, Eros, having made his gigantic promise and shown you in glimpses what its performance would be like, has, quote, done his stuff. He, like a godparent, makes the vows. It is we who must keep them. It is we who must labor to bring our daily life into even closer accordance with what the glimpses have revealed. We must do the works of Eros when Eros is not present. This all good lovers know, though those who are not reflective or articulate will be able to express it only in a few conventional phrases about taking the rough along with the smooth, not expecting too much, having a little common sense, and the like. And all good Christian lovers know that this program, modest as it sounds, will not be carried out except by humility, charity, and divine grace. That it is indeed the whole Christian life seen from one particular angle. Thus Eros, like the other loves, but more strikingly because of his strength, sweetness, terror, and high port, reveals his true status. He cannot of himself be what, nevertheless, he must be if he is to remain Eros. He needs help, therefore needs to be ruled. The god dies or becomes a demon unless he obeys God. And that's God with a capital G. Um, so this is really like... Um, well, he we talked about it kind of in American Gods, but... Um, yeah... This is, um, what am I trying to say? Oh, I think I had to quote on this page. Um, yeah, Eros, honored without reservation and obeyed unconditionally, becomes a demon. Um, so yeah, this is like half the reason why I'm calling it off, because like an alcoholic, um, can't handle, like, oh, I, I can only drink, or, sorry, like an alcoholic who tries to say something like, I'll only drink one drink tonight, and ends up drinking like a whole, like, um, the whole bar. Um, this is one of the reasons why I'm calling off Eros, is because it is like, like most people's love is um, like a warm, comforting, um, sometimes fiery passion. Mine is like getting into like a hot tub, and then me slowly turning up the heat until it's like just very uncomfortable to sit in in general. Um, <laughs> like I, I, it's it's not. Uh, well, okay, that's how that's how I used to. I haven't been in a relationship in like fucking three or four years at this point. Um, so like I like. It's one thing for me to be like um, like yeah, I see like how um, immature I've been in relationships how, like, selfish, this and that, um, toxic, even in some ways, um, and it would be, like, so easy for me to be, like, oh, well, I'll just, like, not be in relationships anymore, and that solves that problem, it's, like, that doesn't actually cure the problem of me, like, not being healthy in some way, so, like, I, it's, like, a matter of, like, yes, I've worked on myself to be, like, in a good partner in a relationship, but without actually, like, endeavoring to be in a relationship, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not just about like, oh, I'm just going to cut this off because I, I, it's not good for me. Like, yeah, it's not good for me, but also like I needed to work on that part of myself too. But anyways, um, Eros, uh, like they said, honored without reservation and obeyed unconditionally. Man, I used to like fall head over heels for the, for the, <laughs> all the cheesy like cliches of love. <laughs> it is what it is, but yeah. 
um, becomes a demon. So yeah, the dosage makes the poison, and I think I'm actually going to make a video about this, because this, this, this line has been, like, kind of, like, subtly in the background of most of my videos, um, how, like, everything needs to be taken in moderation. Which is, you know, just another way of saying the dosage makes the poison, too. Um, but yeah, um, that's one, uh, what was I going to say? I did have this quote, um, that I've always thought about as well. I even mentioned it in my last relationship, <laughs> which is really funny, because, like, I should have just, like, not, <laughs> like, I, I had, I had the... I had the mindset right, but, like, this person came by and, like, really swept me off my feet. But it is what it is. Um, but, yeah. Um, so they say, how many people might not be in love had they not known of its existence? And I'm like, that is definitely me. If I had not been, like, caught in the throes of Disney and indoctrinated from a very early age about, like, oh, love is the... Love is the final solution. I will give you everlasting happiness. Um, man, I don't think I would have done half the things I did. Um, there's probably like some people like, um, well, like I've, I like I've been hurt in relationships. I've hurt other people in relationships. You know, I've been immature. I'm sure everyone has um, this and that. But like, yeah. I, at this point, like, I'm just, like, I, <laughs> yeah, well, half of it is, like, I'm moving on from it. The other half I'll actually explain when we get into Kierkegaard's writing. Um, but there is one other quote, and this one actually kind of came just out of nowhere in the middle of making this video. And I don't, I'm not entirely sure what it means. I think it has to do with, like, um like, finding the right quality of person you're trying to get in a relationship with, um, but you know how, like, women will say, all oh, men are jerks, or guys will say, all oh, women are whores, it's like, why are you going after <laughs> those types of people, then, like, why are you attracted to those types of people, but anyways, the quote is, that which attracts the fly attracts the spider, yeah, that is what it is. Um, but now we'll get into Kierkegaard, and he kind of goes into the more, like, spiritual aspect of love, so, like, it, for me, half of it is, like, as it's in, like, I don't want to hurt anyone, so I won't fall in love type thing. The other half is actually the more important, and, um, probably, um, more than half of the reason. Um, but yeah, we'll get into that. Um, so this is actually Regine Olsen, this is the, uh, lady who Kierkegaard married, and then, or, he was engaged to, and then divorced because... Um, I, I, I still, I still could never find that letter that he wrote to her, explaining to her why he decided to call off the engagement. And it, it, it really bothers me, because it was, like, one of the most beautiful pieces of, like, eh, eh it's whatever. Anyways, um, moving on from that loss... Regine writes, um, Kierkegaard's motivation for the break was his conception of his religious task. He dared not bind himself to anyone on earth in order not to be obstructed from his calling. Um, it kind of rings the same with um, C.S. Lewis's words, um, waging uninterruptedly upon God. Um, so yeah, she says, he had to sacrifice the very best thing he owned in order to work as God demanded of him. Therefore, he sacrificed love for the sake of his own writing. Um, and I think that's one thing I really want to point out is like you can't achieve greatness without a little sacrifice. Um, and that's really one of the one of the, one of the like I said, the main reason why I'm calling it off is because like you do have to sacrifice a little bit to get to achieve any measure of greatness. Um, and if I can sacrifice love, is like ingrained as it is in me to like desire it um if I can like move on from it like that's it's it'll be infinitely more beneficial for both me and the people who might have fallen in love with me as well I would say 
Um, but yeah. Um, this next one, <laughs> it's actually really funny because it's, it's a, a written by a poet who um, completely disregarded like all of this and basically like um, wrote this, like he's writing as if he is Kierkegaard talking to Regine and being like, I'm really sorry for doing that. I should have picked love instead. Um, blah, 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 blah. So I thought it was really funny, but I did want to bring it in anyway. So he says, um, you are my sacrifice, the unconsummated wife of my soul. And I was all too eager to prove how much I loved you, loved him by being willing to give you up. Like Abraham, like Isaac, I was led by my beliefs to believe we would both be spared. I was protecting you from the evil of this age, the evil in myself. I wanted him to bless our union, and I wanted to wear that blessing like a shield. I cannot rescind my leap of faith. I have sent a small gift, but will not attend the wedding. If, after the service, you should chance to look towards the hill above Deer Park, you may feel free to imagine that you see me standing in the full realization that I have misunderstood the deity. The world, Regine, is a killing machine. Each thing searching for some smaller thing, greased and driven by the grist wheel of cruelty. We spend our lives walking and swimming through the bloody swamps of our deeds. I did not... That's such a fucking metal line. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I did not mean to choose him over to you. Can you forgive me my faith? Can you see that I let you go only that you should return? Darling, I would not have harmed you. <laughs> so yeah, he's totally fallen uh, for the Eros's charm. <laughs> totally misregarded everything that Kierkegaard stood for, and all of this, all of this um, thought that went into everything that he did, um, <laughs> and was just like, "Oh, this is what true love should have been. This is this that's this is what the normie NPC perspective would have been." Of like, oh, he really regretted it, and he should have fallen in love with her. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we actually finally get to Kierkegaard's writings on all of this. And I believe this one, um, he had, this was after she had, like, uh, married someone else, and he had, like, visited her at some point. He says, um, this is why it made a strong impact on me today, on me that today, too, went off smoothly. It reminded me deeply and vividly that she does not have first priority in my life. No, no, yet humanly speaking it is true, and how gladly I would express it, that she has and will have the first and only priority in my life. But God has a first priority. My engagement to her and breaking the engagement are actually my relationship to God, are, if I dare say so, in all devoutness, my engagement to God. Um... So he actually says something right here. So he says, um, yet humanly speaking, it is true. And how gladly I would express it that she has and will have the first and only priority in my life. But God has the first priority. So like on a human level, like, yes, love is this powerful force and it's a powerful driving, craving, um, feeling but like that's on a human level it's not it's not the highest you can aspire to I would say it's not the highest level of you it's only on a human it's like saying like um on a on a on an animal level um like sex or um hunger is your is your um first and only priority but, like, on a human level, it's, like, love and friendship and stuff like that. Um, the, and I think we're going to talk about this in the next video uh, that I do. But, like, this idea that humans... The thing that makes humans unique... Um, ooh. Did I write this down somewhere? Um... I don't know if I wrote it down anywhere. But I think I can remember it. Um, the thing that makes humans unique...
is like um this precipice that we have um that we stand on between like animal realm and like the heavenly realm how humans are like they have the capacity to either do like great um um glorious like victory or achievements or like horrendous cruelty um they have the uh power to like either do like reach the heights of spirituality or like scour the depths of like depravity and like a- animality um and so it's like it's it's really like what what side are you feeding like this is okay so this is where i would I'd talk about, like, the person who does, like, an OnlyFans or, like, strips for money. Like, if if you're only doing it for money, money is, like, um, security. It's, 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 it's still, it's, like, the highest of the lower chakras, but it's still a lower chakra, um, type thing. So, like, you're still only feeding the animal side of you when you're doing something only for money. Um, if you're doing something for, like, creativity or, like, creative expression, I would say that's a, that's higher as well. Um, but, um, uh, you really do, like I said, you do have to be honest with yourself and like really understand your motivations and like dig deep and stuff like that. But, you know, it is what it is. I just wanted to mention that. Um, yeah, we'll go on. Yeah, so um, this is uh, entitled My Praying, Character Guard Again. Um, There was a time when I believed it came so naturally, it was childlike, that God expressed his love by sending earthly gifts, happiness, prosperity. How rash my soul was in its desiring and daring. Yes, for I thought something like this. One should not himself make an almighty being stingy and petty. I dared to pray about everything, even the most foolhardy things, with the exception of one thing. Um, And he actually mentions this several times. Um, This one, this topic, I think we're going to go into like, um, um, next time we talk about the denial of death. But yeah, um, so like he did to pray about everything, even the most foolhardy things, with the exception of one thing. Release from a deep suffering that I had undergone for my earliest years, but which I interpreted to be part of my relationship to God. Otherwise, I dared to risk even the most reckless prayers. And when everything else, for the suffering after all, was an exception, went well. How full of gratitude my soul, how blessed it was to give thanks. For my belief that God expresses his love by sending earthly good gifts was unshaken. Um, yeah. Um, this is like, um, I forget the name of the dude, but God and the devil are talking and God says, Hey, look at this guy. He, he prays to me and he worships me. And the devil says, well, he only does that because you're giving him all this stuff. If you were to take it all away, he wouldn't worship you. And then he goes, you're, 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 you're lying. Takes it all away. And I forget what happens in the story, but yeah, basically, (laughs) That's that's what this is. Um, thinking that God expresses his. I've literally heard like a preacher on the radio talk about like, uh, you know, I saw this. I I went to the Walmart the other day, and I saw this raggedy, banged up, really old, bad paint job car, with a bumper sticker that said "God loves me," and I wanted to rip it off, because God does not love you. You look how look how if if God loved you he would provide for you he would give you money for a better car like I've literally heard preachers say stuff like that it's awful anyways <laughs> um we'll go on so this has now changed how did it happen very simply but gradually little by little I became more and more aware that all those whom God actually has loved the prototypes and others have all had to suffer in this world. Furthermore, Christianity teaches that to be loved by God and to love is to suffer. But if this is true, then I would not really have dared to pray for happiness and good fortune. For then, indirectly, it was as if I prayed at the same time. Oh God, will you not stop loving me and let me stop loving you? 
When a desire awakened in me and I wanted to pray, it seemed to be blown away, all my former burning fervor, for it seemed as if God were looking at me and saying, My little friend, consider what you are doing. Do you really want me not to love you, and do you want to be released from loving me? To pray outright for suffering, however, seemed to me to be too high, and I also thought that it could easily be presumptuous, so that God might, as it were, become angry about it, as if I perhaps wanted to provoke him. That is why for some time now my praying has been different, actually a calm leaving of everything to God, because it still is not really clear to me how I should pray. I have been brought up short by this difficulty, but there is still another difficulty for me here. For even if I did find the bold confidence to maintain that to be loved by God and to love God is to suffer, something I have been inclined toward from my early days, I who have long considered myself chosen for suffering. Uh, what about other men? This is the interpretation I have put on my life. After all, I now live in Melancholy's chamber set apart. But I dare to rejoice upon seeing the joy of others, and I dare Christianly to sanction it. To be loved by a woman, to live in a happy marriage, enjoying life, this is denied me. But when I emerge from my chamber set apart, I dare to rejoice upon seeing the happiness of others. I dare to encourage them in, the, in their thought that to rejoice in life and to enjoy life are acceptable to God. To be healthy and strong, a complete man with the expectation of a long life. This was never granted to me, but when I emerge from my solitary pain and move among the happy ones, I believe I dare have the sad joy of encouraging them in their joy in life. Oh, but it must be told that dying to the world to be loved by God means to suffer, and that to love God means to suffer. Therefore, I must disturb the happiness of all the others, and I cannot have the sad joy of rejoicing in their happiness, the sad joy of being loved by them. Therefore, this difficulty has brought me up short. If anyone can show me in Holy Scripture, the New Testament, that to be loved by God and to love God can be combined with enjoying this life, fine, I will accept this interpretation from the hand of God with unspeakable gratitude, glad for myself, but also glad for the others, for I know all too well what men find natural. <clears throat> if anyone can make this clear to me from the New Testament, the game of my cause, if I dare to speak this way, is in such excellent condition that with a little worldly wisdom and trust in God, it can gain a finite victory. Eber, eber, my soul has misgivings about worldly enjoyment and, tempor and the temporal victory. That is why I do not dare use worldly wisdom. I am almost afraid to have temporal for success. For, Christianly speaking, to be loved by God and to love God means to suffer. In any case, in order to have trust in God, for I cannot combine trust in God and worldly wisdom in such a way that, trusting in God, I could use worldly wisdom. I must have the bold confidence not to use worldly wisdom, so that if I do gain a temporal victory, I dare to say confidently, it was God's will, I place it all in his hands by renouncing the use of finite pr prudence. I need, I need a drink of water. But if all this is the case, and if my relationship to God has changed from what it was formerly, does that mean I am less convinced that God is love? No, no, God be praised, no. As I see it all now, it has become more clear to me that God speaks, as it were, a different language than I do, but all the same, he is still infinite love. And how wonderful it is. Just as I once, in looking back over the past, realized how immensely God has helped me, even in the most trifling matters, so I now realize how the very suffering that was sent at a particular time, how everything that went wrong, even the most trifling matters, was designed to wound me in just the necessary way if God was to use me. Infinite love. To suffer in this world. There was a time when I possessed the external conditions for really enjoying life. At the time, my childishly or an adolescent innocence was also of the view that to be loved by God can be expressed by enjoying life. Um, I've also had that um, adolescent innocence before, um, thinking that to be loved by God can be expressed by enjoying life. I've, I used to think stuff like, um, 
um, a life isn't fully lived unless it's, 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 it's like a, um, I think I mentioned this before, how I was more concerned with gathering like a, a, um, a wide variety of experiences without really focusing on like the quality of experience. But yeah, um, we'll continue. If the thorn in the flesh had not been there at the time, I would have gone ahead, but nothing else ever entered my uh, head. But now, perhaps that thorn in the flesh will be removed. It pains me less. But then something else has also happened. I no longer possess the external conditions for being able to enjoy life. And I also have gained another conception of God. Yet, as mentioned, I have been brought up short by this difficulty. I still do not dare decide unconditionally that God does not want me to have a temporal victory. That being loved by God means to suffer applies only to the chosen whereas I and men in general are exempted from it, but then also have a more distant relationship to God. I am still am not strong enough to pray myself into suffering, but I am at a standstill, and in quiet submission to God I await a better understanding. It is so exceedingly high. To be loved by God and to love God means to suffer, and nothing, nothing fills me with such boundless anxiety as the thought of coming too close well, the thought of coming too close to God without being called. Um, otherwise, with regard to the pain of this, to be loved by God and to love God is to suffer. It must be remembered that through the witness of the Spirit, God, yeah, through the witness of the Spirit, God makes it blessed to suffer without removing the suffering. That is why it never occurred to those glorious ones that helping others to get out into suffering could disturb their joy. So it is with the prototypes, the glorious ones, the chosen. But right here is Christendom's chief chief malpractice. On a massive scale, it has been made far too easy to dispense with the chosen ones, to smuggle them out of the way, to assume that all that creates tension in the New Testament was spoken specifically to the apostles, etc., The question is, does the New Testament recognize any other kind of Christian than the disciple? For the humility which does not aspire to be an apostle or a disciple, uh, it can so easily be an enormous knavish trick. That is, we want to get out of the suffering the apostle experienced, and as customary in this human thieves slang, we slightly call it humility and win two advantages getting out of suffering, and being honored for being humble. Not to aspire to the extraordinary gifts of the apostle. Well, that may be, yes, it is humility. But that it is humility not to aspire to his sufferings, no, that gets to be outright hypocrisy. So... I think that pretty much sums up like well he uses the term like apostle or disciple um there's like other spiritual terms um you can use for like what I'm trying to do but um basically it's like you 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 will have to suffer and like everyone does suffer anyways but, like, you, you do have to suffer in specific ways in order to, um, like, you can't avoid the suffering and still, like, try to hold spiritual superiority, you know? Um, not that, like, superiority is the objective anyways, but, yeah, it is what it is, um, that is, um, that is love. Love is, um, like I said, it's a human emotion. It's, it's, um, something to be sacrificed in order to achieve the heights of, of, of human possibility, basically. Um, 
like I said, I'm also doing away with it because um, the people that I love tend to get hurt. I tend to get hurt. Um, stuff like that. Um, I actually wrote something down. Um, about, like, um, opening up your heart to someone, falling in love with him, quote-unquote. I'm um, just saying, I thought I could let you in without letting my demons out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, love is... Mm. At least the kind of love that, um, I'm subject to experience, like, whether... Um, whether you want to consider me like a star-crossed lover or, um, say I was born with a broken heart or whatever you want to, whatever, like, cliche or whatever you want to staple over it, it's like, um, it's, it's, (laughs) it's madness, it's delirium, (laughs) it's, 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 uh, 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 what's the other one, um, it's an ecstasy. It's 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 a it's it's a lunacy. It's it, like you get caught up in its in its like um, enticing. I don't even know how to explain it. <laughs> it's a drug. It's 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 absolutely a drug. Um, it's it's a demon. It's a god. It's all these things. Um, so hopefully. Th- this helps explain it all um i know this one's been a long video too um but it's been a long time coming um hope it was helpful and now that um like i said earlier about like the the um being able to see um when i was talking about um like the 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 higher level thinking being able to like um not strategize but when i was talking about like marvel dc android apple stuff like that like if you can apply that like um strategic level thinking to like okay well if this is love and love is you could almost call it a being or a god or like just this force of nature, um, you can also apply that to, like, other forces, like, um, familial love, or, like, this idea of, like, work and, um, commitment to a corporation, or maybe even, like, a government or a political party or stuff like that, like, all of these things are all trying to work their, work their charm (laughs) over you, um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. All I have to say, I'm going to go look through everything just in case I forgot anything. Nope. Nope, I think that's it. All right, y'all have a good night. I'm um, sorry this was like a month late, but it's and th- this is one of the things that like I've, I've more so like felt been like analyzed (laughs) like I've lived through this philosophy rather than like I uh, tried to put it into words so this one took a while for me to actually like put together I thought it would just be me rambling about this or that but no this was a lot more in depth but yeah hope you enjoy it later